Hello, beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleedin Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And it is truly a blessing to welcome you here right now. In my waking hours, I facilitate angel sessions and soul mentoring and a variety of classes. And there are lots of ways that we can connect. And you can find out more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com or visit me on my Facebook page of the same name. But for now, I am here to help you rest. As I have shared with you before, I am someone who listens to sleep podcasts. I discovered them, I believe, somewhere around 2015, although I can't quite remember. (laughs) But I was away at an event, and there are lots of ambient voices in the place I was staying. And I had heard about the sleep podcast called Sleep With Me. And I couldn't get to sleep. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. I wonder what will (laughs) happen. And it gave me a place to focus my consciousness so that I didn't have to pay attention with what was happening outside of my room. And it worked. And ever since then, I have been listening to sleep podcasts. And I love the genre so much that I have created this for you. So right now, our audience is still small. And in all likelihood, we may already know each other. And if we do, you already have a sense on my style of things, yes, and that I work with the angels and that there's usually joy and love wrapped up in whatever I do. And I love getting a chance to support you. And this may be one of the first times you have even heard of a sleep podcast or are listening to one. And if that's the case, here are my suggestions for you. Get comfortable. I find that it helps me if I turn the volume down low. So if I'm listening to an audiobook during the daytime or a podcast during the day, I might have the volume up because I really want to hear everything that is being said. But with the sleep podcast, you have permission to drift away. I know this sounds odd to be producing content that you may not actually listen all the way through to, but part of the magic I have found with sleep podcasts is they just give us that ambient background chatter that is engaging enough to help our consciousness to begin to let go so that we can go to sleep, but also not so engaging that we can't sleep through it. So I hereby promise to keep you both amused and bored, (laughs) if that's possible. And there will be angels because there are always angels in whatever I do. And I love that you're here. I feel absolutely honored and blessed to get to have this time together. Some of you may have heard me share this before, 
I have a lot of different ways of accessing my guidance when it comes to my soul's path and my work, which isn't really work. I love what I do. I, I love, I love what I do. <laughs> it's, it's the most awesome thing ever. I love getting to do angel sessions for you. I get to facilitate awesome classes. I get to connect with big, bright souls. And I feel really blessed. And also, I reach these times on my path where I have no idea what to do next. <laughs> Maybe I'm feeling uninspired or tired or maybe I just tried something that didn't work. And, you know, just in terms of pulling the curtain back from being self-employed, it is not uncommon to receive what feels like a divine download and then introduce it to the world and it falls flat. That happens. It's okay. And so when that happens, I have to reset. I choose to reset. My husband loves to remind me that whenever I say I have to, to shift it to, I choose. So I choose to reset. And one of the ways I reset is I ask the simplest of questions. I say, how can I show up and love my people right now? How can I love my people and every time I ask that question, I drop right into my heart. And being of loving service is one of my drivers in life. I love it. I'll show up for it. And so this podcast is born of that desire. How can I show up and love you? How can I share love with you? How can I share the love of the angels with you? You know, listening to a podcast as you're falling asleep is deeply intimate. At least it is for me. I put my earbuds in. And it's this intimate, sacred space that I travel to as I drift off to sleep. So I am here to help you drift off to sleep with love, with a loving, friendly voice keeping you company, with the vibration and the energy of the angels to wrap you up and take good care of you. And then I also weave in a story. So I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in. I don't know how you feel about crawling into bed, but it is one of my favorite times of day. Ever since I became an adult who could choose my own bedding, I have opted towards deep comfort, big fluffy comforters and lots of pillows. I, I use <laughs> so many pillows. And then there's extra blankets. And if the night's going to be chilly, I get excited because it means I can add more blankets. I definitely love a comfy bed. So when I invite you to cozy on in and snuggle on up, that's because that's my favorite thing to do at night. I get so excited. I'm like, oh, I get to go to bed now. <laughs> And so as you get ready for bedtime, the angels and I are sending you love. And all you have to do is receive. And I'm going to go ahead and call in the angels, even though they are already here. I always love to give an intentional invitation so that you know they are here as well. And maybe even you will be able to feel or sense or even imagine them being here with you. So let's take a nice deep breath in together. 
and release as we call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, we invite you to join us here. We rise up in gratitude for the opportunity to be in sacred circle with you now. And we feel your gratitude for the opportunity to be present with us as well. Angels, I ask that you help clear our energy fields of anything that does not belong to us helping to clear out any old debris, any old patterns that feel constraining or too small that we no longer need to embody. May these be lifted through grace up into the highest realms where they can be transformed into light to bring to each one of us waves of divine love, waves of compassion, healing, understanding, and light. And angels, I ask that you plant seeds of inspiration for each of the beloveds who are here with us now. Please pave our way with grace, with serendipity, with magic, and with miracles. And dear ones, just take some more deep breaths in, allowing a wave of relaxation and love to pour through and over your body and just breathe as the angels fill the room you are in with a beautiful soft pink light that is going to bring to you healing and love and waves of relaxation. And this light will also be of loving service to others who might be in your heart right now. This love grows exponentially, and so it's easily sent to those you love. And you don't have to do the sending. The angels will send it on your behalf. Just let this love ripple. And breathe. And allow yourself to come present to this loving frequency that is here for you. This form of love is is far beyond what we often generate in our human hearts. This love is profoundly expansive. I contemplate this as a building block of the universe. This love nurtures. It nurtures in us that which we have always been. As beloveds of God, you are born of the breath of God. You are here on purpose. You are a bringer of light. You make this world a better place simply by being here. And just breathe in. And know that in this moment, your angels are whispering words of encouragement and guidance to your soul. That your conscious mind may not know them or hear them, but your soul knows. Your soul knows this expanse 
of love. It is familiar. And it is deeply meaningful to be recognized in this wave of light. So just soak it in and let it be so. I will say to you that while the angels were coming in and as I was preparing to record this episode, I was aware of the flow of energy this week. There's something about today that has been profoundly beautiful. The weather has been gorgeous here in Northern California, where I live. But I've also been feeling profound tenderness that is not mine. There's a lot happening in the world right now. And it can feel hard to focus. This isn't about giving yourself a pep talk, but it is about coming into the energies that support you. You can perhaps think of this podcast as an energetic car wash, yes? (laughs) An energetic cleansing station for your energy field where we can help clear off any of the dust or debris that got picked up during the day to help restore you to your authentic connection with source energy. There's something about plugging right into source energy that clears the way for the brightness of our spirits to come online. You don't need to know how to do this because you already know just intended to be so. Sometimes I vision a beautiful column of light coming into my crown chakra from source energy. And usually I visualize this as beautiful golden light. And I imagine it streaming in. And I imagine how it would feel And I am purposefully using the word imagine because our imagination can unlock a gateway to our divine knowing. So just imagine with me that this beautiful column of golden light is coming to you filled with a beautiful source energy. And it is clearing and calibrating your energy field to make it easier for you to connect with and remember who you are as a divine being in human form. You are a blessing here on earth. Truly you are. And you are worthy of a good night's sleep. The angels and I invite you to drift off. And while you do, I'm going to tell you a story. This episode is going to run about an hour, so you have plenty of time. I'll do my best to keep you both amused and bored. (laughs) So that if you miss any of this, you're not missing anything. But also if you happen to be awake, I'll keep you entertained. So one more breath in, dear ones, and you go ahead and drift into the beautiful mystery of sleep. The angels will be taking care of you, and we will begin tonight's adventure. So tonight, I thought we could go into the Wayback Machine I'm finding that I am really enjoying sharing reflections of life with you. And and tonight, we're going to explore the early days of the internet and of personal computing. Because I, I suspect that most of you who are listening right now are likely old enough to remember life before computers, personal computers, 
and the internet. So this may be a walk down memory lane for you, but also there may be those of you listening who grew up with the internet. And maybe this will be a fanciful tale of what it was like before we had access to Google (laughs) and a computer in the home. So I'm going to ramble for a while and just share some of my personal reflections with you. I I have this fantasy um, that someone might find this 50 years from now or 100 years from now. (laughs) I I don't know why somebody would, but maybe who knows what people will be doing by then. I definitely won't be here anymore. But um, so if you're listening from the future, hello. (laughs) I'm so sorry we have left you with so much to, um, to clean up, but... I'm glad you're here too. So I'm going to start with sharing with you about how I first had an experience with, I guess we'll call it a personal computer. So it was probably about 1986 or 87 when I was working at the Samuel Goldwyn Company and they installed a word processor. Now, back in the day, this was a whole machine. It it had a a screen and a big machine that went with it. And basically, it was just a word processor. So it was what you would normally have done on a typewriter you could put into this machine and make corrections and it would save a document. And they had it placed near my desk. Not that I was the only one using it, but there just happened to be an empty desk near mine. And so people would come and use it. We all shared one and we shared one word processor. And that was my first experience with what might be considered a personal computer. That was really all they did back then in the world that I lived in. They may have done other things and universities and things, but in the regular corporate world, that was how they worked. And it should also be said that it was right around this time that fax machines were invented. Prior to that, you would send a telex, which was, um, I won't go into what a telex was, but faxes were just being invented on that awful thermal paper that would fade after six months. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. We'll just keep going on. (laughs) We'll keep going. So that was my first experience with a computer that I would use. Everything else back then was written, so I was responsible for putting together schedules for television stations and things, and I did all of that manually. I had giant ledgers and spreadsheets and I would type things up. So, so that word processor was my first experience. Within a year or two, I went to work for another company and I was an executive assistant to the owner of the company and he was really a visionary. And I I could do a whole episode on him because you would likely know who he is if I shared about more about him, but I'm not going to because it's not about that yet. And don't try and guess. He's not somebody who's so super famous that you'd be like, wait, you were working for Jeff Bezos. It's nothing like that. (laughs) But this man that I was working for really was a visionary. I, I don't know that I knew that at the time, but he was way ahead of the curve in many ways. And one of the things that he was ahead of the curve on was personal computing. So as his assistant, I had a computer at my desk. So the first time that I had a computer that I was responsible for. And back then, computers, um, I, I can't remember if the apples were out at that point, but ours was a DOS-based computer, which now would be called a PC. And the 
computer had a dial-up modem. And part of my training, so my the person I was replacing was training me, and he had to teach me how to use this computer, which was DOS-based. Windows didn't exist then. So in order to run a program, you would go to the C prompt, and then you would type in CD for change directory backslash, and then the program you wanted to run. So if I wanted to run Word, I would put in CD backslash Word. So that part I could get with because that was similar to the word processor I had used in my old job. But now we were getting fancy in that he wanted me to use this computer to book air travel, which back then we did through Easy Saber, which was its own program. You would have to go into the modem, dial up Easy Saber, and then using a series of DOS prompts, book his air travel, which to me felt cumbersome and difficult. And I had pages and pages and pages of notes on how to do this because there was no internet. I couldn't Google (laughs) how to book air travel. I just had my handy dandy notes that my predecessor had helped me put together. And I think we also had access to Nexus Lexus for news. And I remember thinking how silly it was to have to do this online. Shows you what kind of, you know, early adopter I was. Because I could just call the travel agent, who was a really nice guy who I liked to talk to. So if I had to book travel, why wouldn't I just not call him up and say, hey, can you get us some air travel to Santa Fe this weekend? And so I would kind of surreptitiously call the travel agent when I was supposed to be doing this online, which wasn't even called online at that point. (laughs) Online was not a term that we used. And I remember one day he wanted me to book something and he happened to be walking by my desk and noticed that I was on the phone with the travel agent. And he said, Laurel, why aren't you doing that on Easy Saber? (laughs) I said, I just thought it'd be easier. He goes, I want you to learn how to do this on Easy Saber. And I was like, oh no, okay. (laughs) And so I sat there. CD backslash Easy Saber. (laughs) And then the modem dialed up, which I will not make the noise of because you are trying to sleep. And I figured out how to do it. So that was my first entree into doing something over a modem (laughs) was working for this person and having my own personal computer that... My phone is probably 10 times more powerful than right at, you know, these days. But back then that was the groovy thing we could do. And, and I also did other things, um, that just sort of grew to other things on the computers. And I won't go into that part because, um, this is really about the early days of the internet. So we're going to go to some other parts of the development. I just thought I would squeeze that in there about the early days of personal computing. So, Now we're going to skip forward to 1994 or 1995. The first real online program that a lot of the masses used was AOL. I don't know how many of you remember the days where every magazine you picked up had an AOL disc that would fall out of it. (laughs) We all had many, many invitations from AOL to sign up. And um, if you ever watch the movie, You've Got Mail, it is around the time of AOL and its glory days. And the thing was, is I did not yet have my own computer, so I couldn't really sign up for AOL. But then I received a small inheritance from a dear aunt and... I was able to fund getting my first laptop. 
I was living in New York at the time. And I went to one of those, you know, camera electronic stores in New York to purchase a laptop. I think the laptop cost about $2,500, which was a lot of money back then. And didn't do much again. I think my phone is a hundred times more powerful than that laptop was. But I had a laptop, which was super cool. So I brought it home and it needed a dial-up modem. So I could only either be on my phone talking or I could be online with my computer. But I couldn't do both because cell phones at that time were very expensive per minute. So I had a landline. That was it. So I brought my computer home. So again, I think it's around 1995. And I love television. So if you know, um, if you heard my past episode, I went over some 1970s television shows. And you will know that I love TV. So here I was with my love of television, and now I have this laptop computer. The thing to remember about the time before personal computing and the internet was how differently our minds worked and research worked. So if you wanted to find a new chocolate chip cookie recipe, you would look up different cookbooks. So you might go to the library and go into the, um, the card catalog and look up different cookie recipes, or there might be one published in the newspaper. And so even when it came to personal computing and AOL and what would then become the web, you couldn't just look up on the computer how to do something. So it was not uncommon in the early days to purchase books and directories that would tell you about these different chat rooms, how to access something through AOL, and when the web came online to purchase these big directories that would list different websites you could go to for research. It seems so crazy now, but that's what things were like back then. So when I got my computer, the World Wide Web, we used all three words, was just coming online. I think Netscape was the first web browser. I think that that's correct. This isn't a history lesson, so if I'm getting it wrong, forgive me. And I figured out how to get the World Wide Web installed on my computer. And most people hadn't seen it yet. They did not have it. And so between that and learning about chat rooms and AOL, I was so excited. So 95, it's 1995. And there's a few television shows that I love. One was Chicago Hope. Now, most of you are not going to remember this show because Chicago Hope had the misfortune of premiering opposite at the same time as ER. So two medical dramas set in Chicago and ER, of course, became a massive hit. Chicago Hope was awesome. It had Mandy Patinkin, Adam Arkin, Hector Elizondo. It was such a good show, and I loved it. And at this time, I'm also loving Mandy Patinkin, you know, Princess Bride, <laughs> and his um, CDs. So I find my way to a Chicago Hope chat room. So again, remember, a very small percentage of people are online at this point, not like it is now. 
And, um, and so every, every episode we would wind up getting online and talking about the episode and talking about Chicago Hope. And I felt like I had found home. There were other people that I could talk about Chicago Hope with. I was so excited. And the producers would sometimes come into the chat room with us. This was not something formal that their publicists had put together again This was the super early days of early adopters who just would find their way together. And one day, this is just this cute story I want to share with you. One evening, I'm on in the chat room and the producers come in and they go, Mandy Patinkin is in here with us. He's reading your comments. And of course, we're like, no way. We were all so excited. And they said, how do we know it's him? And he and Mandy Pentekin writes in, give me your phone numbers. I'll call a few of you. And so all, all of these digits start flowing across the screen. And I couldn't share mine because remember, I had to be online on my landline and couldn't share my, he couldn't get a phone call while I was online. But within a few minutes, people started coming back into our chat room going, oh my God, it's him. He said, my name is Aniko Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. (laughs) And we were agog. We were so excited. And that, to me, was one of the super cool experiences of the early days of the internet, when magic would just happen because the audience was so small. You know, things are very different now in terms of being able to connect with people. But back then, that was really magical. And another really cool thing that happened is um, I loved soap operas. I watched the whole ABC lineup, All My Children, One Life to Live, General Hospital. And I really loved One Life to Live at that point. And Again, I, I found my way to a One Life to Live chat room. And it turns out that it was frequented by a couple of the cameramen from One Life to Live. And we started chatting and somehow in the chat room, I shared that I was on the World Wide Web. Again, you had to use all three words. <laughs> it wasn't just the web at that point. I was like, I'm on the World Wide Web. And they were fascinated. They said, what is it like? What does it look like? And and they said, we'd love to see it. And I said, well, I, I could come to New York and show it to you. I lived in Westchester County at the time. I was in Terrytown, which is about 45 minutes out of Manhattan. I said, I could come to New York and show you. They're like, yes, yes. And so... They arranged for me to get to come down to the studio where One Life to Live was shot so that I could demo the World Wide Web for them. (laughs) It couldn't have gotten better than that at that moment. I was beside myself with excitement. I was thrilled. I I was going to get to go to the One Life to Live studio (laughs) and see where it was filmed. And then I was going to get to share the World Wide Web with them. And I did. And it was super cool. And um, I don't know, it was one of those moments, you know, I was still young then and it made me feel so important it just made me feel magical and special that somehow I had manifested this, even if I didn't know what manifesting was at that point, that something super cool and magical had happened because I knew how to access the world wide web. <laughs> and I don't have any really good stories after that. Like I became best friends with all the actors. I, so there's no great follow up other than that was a whole magical moment. And um, the other thing that I often talk about was we had never experienced anything like the World Wide Web before. 
before it, again, research was linear. So if I wanted to learn about an event or find a recipe, we would think in almost 2D, right? So I might look up an article and read it, but I would go to the library for that. Or we all had, um, well, we had the world book encyclopedia, right? You might have had an encyclopedia at home, either the Encyclopedia Britannica or the world book, and it would get updated once a year. And so research was very, very different before the internet. So I remember when I first started using the web that this experience of clicking on a hyperlink and it would take you through a portal almost, it would take you through the link into something else. And it was a radically different way of thinking. And I even remember having dreams where I could feel my brain rewiring to this radical new way of processing data. Before that, I was a library girl, right? You go to the library to research something. And even though I had learned how to use Easy Saber or Nexus Lexus, on a DOS-based computer. It was nothing like the internet where you simply would click a link and be taken into a new universe. You know, before that, you had to almost know what your task was and what you were looking for and use your intellect to figure out how to get there. This idea that there was this intuitive engine building intelligence that you would click on a link and be taken into a new portal, our minds had never had to process data in that way before. And I had several weeks of dreams where my mind was rewiring. I would be clicking links in my sleep and I could feel my consciousness shifting to accommodate this new way of contemplating our world. I often think of that because it is a reminder that our consciousness is resilient and ever-evolving. You know, now we don't think twice about clicking on a link to get the information we want, but it's really important that we recognize that that relationship with data and researching is less than 25 years old. A lot of us did not get on the internet until the late 90s. And now it's such an integral part of our lives and our consciousness and our history So it's not much, you know, 25 years is not a lot of time. Some of the other things that I remember from that time was I, and I don't know that, (laughs) I'm not proud of this, but um, I was an early adopter of Amazon. So I made my first purchase through Amazon. I just looked it up because it's all in my Amazon history. I made my first purchase from Amazon in, on December 5th of 1995, I, I bought a book by Meryl Marco, What the Conversations, What My Conversations with My Dogs Have Taught Me, something, something like that. And um, another book about cats, I must have purchased them as presents to someone. And in 1996, I purchased a book that I sent to my parents. And I thought Amazon was such a cool idea that you could buy books online and they would send them to you. And I was such an early adopter of Amazon that the first 
two years, maybe three years, that I was purchasing from them, they sent out Christmas presents. So one year I got a mouse pad that said Amazon on it. And the next year I got a travel mug. It was a plastic travel mug, not the cool stainless ones that we have now. That was a radically different business model. Amazon is not the 10 ton gorilla that it is now. They were a a much smaller company. And, um, you know, just as an aside for being an intuitive person, I am terrible with the stock market. I mention this because at some point I purchased AOL stock, I purchased Amazon stock, and I purchased Netflix stock. Not a lot, just a little bit. I didn't have a lot of money then. And you go, that's great though. You know, at least with, you know, Amazon and Netflix, those are great stocks. Well, they weren't when I sold them. (laughs) So I bought some AOL shares right before they merged with Time Warner and their stock price went into the toilet. So yeah, that was me. And I bought Amazon stock and then I thought, it's not going anywhere. (laughs) I'll sell it. This was before they became the 10 ton gorilla. And then I had Netflix stock which I thought, eh, I don't know where they're going. (laughs) This DVD thing by mail, it's interesting, but I don't know that they're going to grow. And I sold the stock right before they went into the streaming business. So just so we're clear, you never want to come to me for stock market advice. (laughs) I think somewhere in my, um, in my life agreement, it said, you will never be able to make a jillion dollars in the stock market, Laurel Bleed and Buffet. So yeah, don't listen to me when it comes to that kind of stuff. <laughs> so those were some of my early experiences. And, and one of the things I loved so much about the, the early days of the internet and chat rooms was that whatever the micro interests were, I could find other people to talk to about whatever I was interested in. I used to hang out in astrology chat rooms and chat with people from around the world who were these amazing astrologers. It's like whatever I was interested in, I could find other people to talk to about it. And, you know, these days we take for granted that they are tracking data on us for everything. And the algorithms exist so that if you like this kind of music, you'll like that other artist, right? Or you go into Amazon and if you've purchased a certain kind of cereal, they'll say, have you thought of this other kind of cereal? And I want you to know that I was so hungry for that, not the cereal, but the algorithms back in those days from 95 till, I don't know, 97, I worked for a company that processed sales data for the music industry and the video industry. And at the time I was in love with several folk artists who never got radio play. And I kept saying to people, listen, I, there has to be a way to build a program that says, if you like this artist, you should try these other artists. And people would say, yeah, yeah, I don't know if that's possible. (sighs) I didn't have the, I didn't know how to build something like that. But now that exists, right? Now that's a part of life. If there's an artist I like, if there's a show that I like on Netflix, I'll instantly get dozens of other recommendations. But way back in 1997, that did not exist. And I remember going into these meetings and suggesting that we somehow find a way to build these programs that would do recommendations like that. And people did not seem profoundly interested. 
little did we know what kind of world we were going to be creating. So from those early days, moving forward, it's fascinating to me now what is available to all of us. I know there's a a dark side to all of this data being accumulated, but for right now, I'm just really enjoying being in the innocence of our early days together on the internet. I met some wonderful people and had some absolutely magical experiences. And I knew, I knew that it was going to change the world. Not everybody did. Not everyone understood my level of enthusiasm. I was like, this is going to change everything. This is going to be the great equalizer. I couldn't really see what was going to come. I, I, I didn't necessarily see the damage that it would also create, but the early days were joyful. I think even I, I came onto Facebook in December of '09, and I was a little late coming to the party with Facebook. And I just remember how interesting it was to be able to connect with people I had gone to grammar school with or college friends. Again, the innocence of Facebook back then, before we knew what it would become. And, you know, Facebook changed the face of my business. I think many of you who are listening now, we found each other through Facebook. So there are many, many blessings that have been bestowed from this monolith that is the internet. And our consciousness now learns a different way to process. You know, when I used to, especially around 2008 to about 2010, when I was channeling Josephus and the angels would talk about how different these new children will be because they are growing up processing more data points and stimulus than any generation has ever had to process before. And I often think about that. The amount of consciousness or data points that I had to process when I was younger is so much smaller than what children now process. It's like we're in this constant space of stimulation and it's a world that runs 24-7. And I think that's one of the reasons I so appreciate the invitation to sleep and rest and disconnect. So lots of magical stories here, and maybe you have yours. You know, what was one of your first super cool experiences on the internet? Do you remember? Did you bump into someone you haven't connected to in a long time? Or did you have a niche you were interested in? You know, whether it was creativity or a television show, or something that you loved, and you were finally able to connect with other people about it. I'm so grateful that this happened, because I found you, right? A a podcast exists because of the internet. It's like it's a part of our lives. It is a part of the breath of consciousness that we're in these days. And so... Here's to this weird, wild societal development that has taken place in our lifetimes. You know, I would imagine for many of you, you also remember the world before the internet. Yes. How many of you remember having to go to the library to do research and you would get out the microfilm or the microfiche? and try to find a newspaper article on something you had to write a paper for. And now it's just all there. It's crazy. And it's awesome. It's amazing. 
What a miraculous time we live in. Who knows what's coming next? But I am grateful I get to be here with you. So my beautiful friends here is still living in a time of miracles where we are helping to evolve consciousness. And I'm glad that you're here and we get to connect over this newfangled thing called a podcast that you can download from somewhere that we don't quite understand. And then I get to whisper to you as you drift off to sleep with lots of love from the angels. So I love you very much. I wish you the sweetest of dreams. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you.